the regulations shall be made with reasonable consideration to the character of the district and its peculiar suitability for particular uses, and with a view to conserving the value of buildings and encouraging the most appropriate use of land. It's very clear that it doesn't say that you have to get the absolute highest economic value out of the land. And I've contended for many years that uh, if the zoning statute is observed, if the city council, without undue pressure from uh, either side, actually carries through on the basis of the fundamental purpose of the zoning statute, zoning will work. Zoning changes, as presently practiced in Dallas, are popularity contests. And if you can get enough people coming down either for or against, and it's a lot easier to bring down people against than for, you will influence the outcome of zoning case regardless of the merits of the case. So that when people come to me and they want to know what are the chances of getting this proper zone, I say, well, how much opposition do you have? Not what, uh, what uh, uh, should be zoned on your property or what are the merits of your case. How much opposition do you have? And then I'll tell you what your chances are. The public has to be aware of its rights when there is a zoning hearing and it affects them. They should make themselves heard, make their voice heard. At the same time, you have to recognize that uh, the city council and the city plan commission, being subject to pressures from all sides of the argument, have to be objective and have to follow the law. In recent years, the city of Dallas has gone to the neighborhood commission where they have meetings in various parts of the city and everybody's invited to attend and express their view. And they gather from these neighborhood commissions how the people feel about how their particular area should be, uh, uh, should be zoned. The present procedure of neighborhood committees, in my opinion, is an effort on the part of the city council and the city planning commission to shift their responsibility to somebody else. What they have done, say, we'll call in the neighbors and let the neighbors tell us how to exercise our legislative discretion. I think that by doing that, they are inviting an unbiased opinion with regard to how somebody else should use their property. Most of the people who show up at these hearings are single-family homeowners in areas where the property is not yet developed, and those people want everybody else's property to be developed with single-family homes, bigger and more expensive than their own. Uh, and I think that that's a fair statement of what happens at these neighborhood meetings. Now, another thing that I think makes the law workable and makes it fair is that there are so many classifications of zoning. There's all type of single-family residence where you prescribe the size of the lot, all the way from 5,000 square feet to an acre. Uh, there are two-family uh, districts. Neighbors tell the city planning commission, city council, how my property should be developed. I should have an opportunity to have it reviewed by the court and to let it be decided by an impartial group so that if you are going to invite everybody around to come in and be heard, then I think a property owner, if his property is not rezoned, should have the opportunity to go into a district court and have a jury of 12 non-interested persons pass on whether or not the zoning restrictions on that property is reasonable or is it unreasonable in light of all the circumstances. If you realize that, uh, that in the uh, general overall context, the real purpose of the law is to have orderly development. If you realize that with good zoning, you can preserve open spaces, which is a great lack in every city today. If you realize that with good zoning, you can maintain at least minimum standards. It's afraid to have a city without a zoning ordinance, without any zoning, because then it's left to the individual, and you can't control the man next to you. True, there's such a thing as deed restrictions. But 18 owners can have 18 different sets of deed restrictions on 18 adjoining pieces of property. And I think for orderly development, you need effective zoning. One thing our cities lack is beauty, and beauty comes about through a very carefully developed city. And I think with orderly zoning, properly enforced, with, a, with an objective city council and an objective city plan commission, you can develop a beautiful city. And I think for this reason, that having a zoning ordinance is helpful and, will, and, and really uh, causes the city to develop the way the fathers, the city fathers originally planned that it should develop. <laughs> With specific reference to the Perot case, uh, there the homeowners had uh, weeks and weeks and weeks of debate and argument among themselves, many meetings among themselves, meetings with lawyers, meetings with Mr. Perot, meetings with experts. 
And uh, at, a, at a mass meeting that they held uh, privately in, in uh, one of the schools or churches out there, uh, they debated this issue at great length, and they did what the majority wanted to do. If a neighborhood is already formed, and they, people have spent their money and built their homes and developed that neighborhood and have pride in it, when a stranger comes in and buys a piece of land that he wants to do something else with, he buys with malice of forethought. He knows what the neighborhood is like. He knows these people have built their homes. And if he puts his money in that land, he has to take his risk that these people are not going to like that change. I think someone in the audience pointed out, and I want to emphasize, that the Neighborhood Advisory Committee is only advisory. The, the experts at the City Hall don't have to follow their advice. I think it's helpful for the Council and the Planning Commission to know how the neighbors feel, but there's no absolute requirement that they go along with their decisions. 